Hello, this is John Miller, the creator of Thrust of Everest. I think I can safely say that this show is, without a doubt, the most in-depth look into the entire experience of what it takes to climb Everest, as well as some other peaks throughout the Himalayas. But all of the events in the series are shown in chronological order, so if you're new to the show, please go all the way back to episode 000 and watch everything in order. That's truly the best way to enjoy it. Thanks. This is the Rest of Everest video podcast, an almost unabridged expedition experience. Episode 189, Practice Makes Perfect. Hey, you. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Rest of Everest. I'm John Miller. Season 6, K2 and Broad Peak. And uh, we're now getting into it. We're actually in uh, the actual climbing phase. And I'm joined, as always, uh, with Brian Block. How you doing, Brian? Awesome. Good. Uh, well, this week we're going to continue on the tutorial, so to speak, um, of how to uh, properly ascend and descend uh, while uh, on the climb. You know, we started we started uh, this tutorial last week, but we're going to finish it this week. This whole episode is going to be kind of a how the sausage is made, <laughs> so to speak. Um, all the the technical details that really get kind of glossed over when you when you see anything about any uh, programs about mountaineering. And uh, I think it's fascinating, and I think you will too. So let's head back up to uh, those Seracs uh, underneath Broad Peak, and let's rejoin the expedition. So here we go. Always just practice putting your ascend on. Uh, probably the other so way. this is exactly where we left off sort of last week. <coughs> yeah, this was uh, you know kind of a shakedown session. Make sure everybody had their uh, systems in order and, and were experienced. I mean, you know, some of the people were. This was a kind of a new experience. You know, technical climbers that were skilled but managing uh you know fixed ropes uh, can be a whole nother game in this uh, game of climbing and you you were a client on this expedition you were not one of the guides correct? i was one of the assistants actually one no. of the assistants yeah. okay yeah so that's gotta so, that's gotta be a really uh, just a common thing to to finally get an ex an ex uh, an opportunity to kind of go through all of your your clients and figure out just where they are in terms of uh their their knowledge and skill is that yeah? Is that how it works? Well, oh, it's not uncommon to have people show up that uh, have an awesome resume, but uh, it, none of it is actually true. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, great on paper. They don't have the field yeah, experience. Yeah, exactly. Or you know, maybe they were short roped up some uh, other somewhat technical mountain and, and really had none of the skill set themselves to climb it independently. So. You know, but then again, there's people like, you know, here where uh, you, you see someone else's system and you go, oh, well, that's yeah. easier and quicker. Uh, do you guys and, call clear and everything? You know, as usually? safe. Uh, I mean, that, that is courtesy. Yeah. yeah. When you're climbing with somebody else, like yeah. a rope partner. Oh, uh, if you're in a rope team, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And do you guys always wait till everybody clears the anchor before you're on the same line? It d totally depends on the actual section of rope you're on. Sure. As often you'll have more than people. Might be running out 60 meters, 70 meters to the next anchor. Sure. Um, in which case, it's going to take a while. Yeah. And it depends on the terrain. But it's generally, pretty it's, it's good practice to, uh, to wait till the rope's cleared. And that's it's, that's Ben. Yeah. That's it's something that we'd practice Aussie before buddy. on K2. Cause just because we saw like the Czech team, they'd have four guys on a section of rope this long. Yeah. Just all yarding on it. And it was like... And like you just said, the anchors can sometimes be more for feel good than actual <laughs> you know, anchors. Yeah, yeah. So it's like watching four guys yard on it. I was like, oh man, yeah. they're all gonna go for a wild ride together. That's it. <coughs> yeah. okay. Get it. So yeah, you can jug right on that. You can pull right on that defender. Push it right up. Dun, dun, dun. That's it. Push right off there. Yeah, in a perfect world, you don't actually wait the fixed lines. They're just there as a right the a feel good measure, you know. And actually, it's uh, it's really can be straining on the other people in a rope team if you have uh, somebody else yarding on the rope and you're trying to you know release from the anchor and move around to the next uh, section. So it's uh, it's <laughs> interesting to see how some of these people you know manage it and. And that their expectations are. Well, videos on this out there on the web. I don't think. Okay. Yeah. Would you so would you mind explaining how an ascender works? Yeah. Like uh, the, an ascender basically is a spring-loaded so mechanism, and it has little teeth uh, that track into the rope because the rope's a braided, <laughs> you know, piece, obviously, and so it gets into the, the teeth get into the little uh, section, so it'll move one way. You know, sliding forward, yes, and then if you try and pull backwards, it's that's when the teeth engage. So it just slides up the line. 
You know, it kind of does the same thing as a, a Prusik, but it's a mechanical version. So it slides up, you know, and where a Prusik you can also slide back or a Climb Heist you can slide forward or back. Uh, the Ascender really only goes one way, which makes it uh, interesting when you're, you know, using it as a backup descending. I mean, there's a whole other skill set uh, there. You know, and so it, it's uh, for the, if you end up being tied in with other people while also climbing on a fixed rope through sections. You do a fair bit usually, the, the last person will, will use an ascender <laughs> as an anchor, and it's uh, yeah. it's a whole yeah, other skill set. So how you I mean, just uh, yeah, moving on fixed lines is a it's its own thing for sure. Well, you notice that he just uh, so he's he's got his ascender on the line. You guys coming down yep. on the other side, and then, then? he put his he put okay. a carabiner on there, and he's got another carabiner. So. One of, one of the things that always impresses me and has always impressed me about uh, mountaineering and rock climbing in, in general, climbing in general, is all the, the amount of redundancy that you try to factor in um, to all of your uh, support systems and anchors and everything. Um, you never yeah. want to rely on just one piece of equipment. So there, we, you're relying on the rope, certainly. That's a singular, a singularity. Yeah. But, but he's got a sender on, then he's got a carabiner, and sometimes maybe another carabiner. So if the sender comes off, the carabiners are around the rope. So that's yep. going to, he might go for a slide, but he's not going to fall all the way down. Yeah, hopefully yeah, he won't go further than the last anchor, you know, mm -hmm. or the next anchor, depending on which direction of travel he's got. But even f setting the fixed lines, uh, as you can see, like, you know, someone has to lead climb and put these ropes in. So there is still technical difficulty in, in being on the front end of this. Uh, and, you know, doing it well is it's a real special skill set as well. It's because you have to have the right amount of slack. So you can, like in this position where Mike's rappelled in, you know, he needs enough slack that he can kind of be below the anchor to clip into the next set of fixed line. And then also be able to have enough slack in it to free himself uh, from his descending device. When you're doing this figure eight threading and stuff, yeah. a really good thing to do is keep your figure eight on the carabiner, right. okay, until you have actually right. put some rope in, and then yeah. unclip it, and then and then you stand less chance of dropping it. And then you use your muncher hitch. <laughs> yeah. so, same when you actually take it out. Yeah. Actually take it off the thing, keep a hold of the thing, put the rope over, and then clip it in as soon as you can. So don't like pull the rope off it completely until you. So he's using a figure eight here? Yeah. I think. Um, we also mentioned, uh, you, you probably heard it in the last episode, maybe in this episode already, but uh, Ben kept yeah. using the term ATC. Yep. And uh, so, for those of you not so in the know, that that's another kind of uh, like, uh, blade device, which something. can be used as a, you need to lock off. What are you um, do? a way to descend a rope. Uh, yeah, just the one challenge with it being that <clears throat> it's got a narrow uh, opening, and so you can't pass a knot through it. You always have to move around a knot as though it's an anchor. But if you're you know skilled with it and have a lot of experience, uh, it's not that much more challenging. And frankly, I think there's a lot more control. Uh, on the descents with an ATC, so I still, that's usually my device or, or, or a munter hitch. A lot of a lot of this stuff on, on Broad Peak, I would just arm wrap rappel mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just have a, a carabiner and then a backup, you know, redundantly keeping me attached. Otherwise it won't. You can always, you can always wrap around a couple of times and then clip it into another beaner. Uh, you don't want to, you don't want to rely on your gear loop. Okay. So... Yeah. Every time you wrap it, just yeah. yeah. Step over. Step over. Step. Yeah, so the name of the game, name of there the game go. here is friction. It's yeah. all about yes. friction. Yes. So, he, so he's wrapping that. He probably won't be able, you know, to use friction and holds him in place. Very effective. Yeah. Yeah. It's it works incredibly well, and it's you know just one of these simple things that yeah, kind of you know he, he'd never experienced before. So. <laughs> Yeah, pull it up tight like it's, you're doing a. Uh... Yeah, there you okay. go. Cool. So that's, I mean, that's one option. Okay. Yeah. The other thing is you could grab your grab your ascender out, put that above the ATC. Yeah. Put that above your descender. Yeah. So. so get, grab your gemmer out, put that above it. It's then, probably easier than this one. <laughs> yeah, some, depending on, it depends you know, on what gear you got available. Depends yeah. on what gear you got available. Always have something as a backup that you can yeah. use. So. Like, 
In most sort of climbing situations, you will not have a Jumar on you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So once once again, Rob, there is uh, kind of expounding on uh, you. You want to have a you want to have a backup. You want to always be able to have something else to rely on. And I think yeah, that's that's just always again always fascinating to me. Um, back back in the days when I was uh, climbing regularly, <laughs> that there, there's also several ways to do everything, and each has their advantage and disadvantage. Yep. Uh, and also depending on what gear you might have on you, it's, it's this running catalog in your head of options and, and knowledge on equipment. Yeah, knowing when to bring it in. So I always have lots of respect for for climbers doing this stuff. There's a lot more going on than you than just the outward appearance. Oh yeah. There's how your harness is fitted, how you're sit sitting in it. You know, I mean, what's attached to where. It's all uh, it's all pertinent. In so the management game of climbing. Keep going, keep going. All the way. As much as you can. That's it. All the way. Which is why, <laughs> if you want to get into this kind of thing, the best way to get into it uh, is to get some instruction and uh, start slow <laughs> and move your way up. Uh, certainly do not use an episode like this uh, as your instruction. Um, yeah, it's, you can't it really will open you up to the uh, to what's going on, but don't use this as instruction. You really want hands-on instruction by uh, you know someone who's qualified uh, to uh, teach you, whether that be uh, an instructor or a friend with lots of experience um, yeah. who who you can trust. Oh, I absolutely concur, and that's why I intentionally didn't show a lot of the front of where the harness uh, attachment goes on, just because you know there's different ways to do it and. You know, just inferring from what you can see at a side angle or from the the front so where the ascenders are connecting doesn't really show all of it. This kind of gives you an idea about what's going on. You know, when you're on an expedition like this, a commercial expedition especially. I mean, if uh, me and Fabrizio and Chris or something were going to go climb something like this and or other things similar to it like we have, we probably wouldn't end up using... You know a lot of these systems, but uh, so even, so you know, for really K two we do for sure. Thing. It's actually, no. it's a guide. It's almost a guide for the rope. So uh, well, because a thin yeah. rope will pop through there much, much easier than sure. a thick rope. So yeah, it is is essentially to stop that from popping out. A lot of aid climbers will throw one on there just when they're jumaring up, yeah. just for orientation and for friction. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Do you do that, Rob? You did. Oh yeah. I got to be an aid climber. Uh, that's probably more than me. I do a lot of French free. Do <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like you climb the captain? It's a key 18-year-old. That is not unusual. Yeah, unfortunately, I got that on camera. Have you been on the captain for <laughs> No. I just have no desire. This doesn't interest me at all. You know what you should go and do? What's that? Norway's place of half turn. Yeah? Cool. It's 90%, 95% I'll show you a quick thing here. See, that'd be more interesting. Because I'm not, I'm probably not a 513, you know, fingers climber. You're probably not, Brian? Well, I have before. But okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, my, my desire has shifted a bit. Maybe on the shoulder, and then just near the end of the cable. pulling through. Then just walk down and... It's cool, huh? Took a little bullet pack with us. Nice. Sweet. Two liters of water and run. Some of you ate a little bit, but okay. easy aid and stuff. Before you've got your you're second that with a gree gree. And the rest of it, we just led uh, and seconded the whole fit. Oh, cool. So it's sweet. Right yeah. Yeah. Through there. Yeah. Okay, so that's on the rope now. You can't drop that. Yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. for me, the uh, really hard technical rock okay. climbing was a lot of fun, but it just seemed like I was always. Experiencing different minor oh, injuries of pulley tendons pictures? and everything else. So <laughs> oh, this is a lot more fun. Okay. Plus the views are better than you know, gymnastic <laughs> rock climbs for the most part. Bring her along, pregnant. <clears throat> Why? What was it? I don't. I don't know. Oh. Yeah. Put it on the right. 
The only thing missing from this beach party is uh, beer. <laughs> no beer. <laughs> We're all just hanging out on the on the glacier, and it was actually really warm. But when the clouds would trap that heat in like that, it would, it would be, you know, much warmer than uh, even on a clear sunny day. So the wind would blow through, but this was just it was a perfect day for doing this kind of training while they're putting in the first set of fixed lines up towards Camp One. Okay. You think it was just below freezing or just above freezing? Uh, you know it. <laughs> You know, it's it's always funny because like when it the heat gets trapped like that, it was probably you know reading at uh, ten or fifteen degrees, but it felt like forty five. Yeah, that glacial you know snow, it just it holds that heat and reflects it back. So. Now, are the six millimeter lines standard? Uh, out there, usually the higher you go, the thinner the line gets what are the words <laughs> because it's just less to carry. Exactly, the you know that's what for K two fixing the bottleneck. There'll be uh, like six or sometimes even you know just tiny, tiny Dyneema cord, um, which isn't doesn't work that well with uh, most ascenders, as Ben was saying before. You know, it's like six mil is about as, as small as they'll even accommodate, and it says usually eight mil or bigger. Mm -hmm. And kicking into the rope, we usually don't. Well, we don't go for that. So <laughs> there's uh, there's all kinds of stuff going on, and, and even with fixed lines like this, you're constantly, you know, you, you need to be physically climbing the mountain. Otherwise, you never know when one will pop out because it's in, you know, some kind of glaciated snow that got a little too much sun one day, and the the metal, of course, of a picket will kind of melt itself out. So. Well, you can see the snow um, is uh, definitely seeing a lot of the sun. Oh, yeah. You can see it's all eroding. Yeah, a lot of this uh, glaciated area we would walk through every day, but it was, uh, it was really pretty, but it was also kind of told you how dramatic things were changing on a daily basis. Taking attention with you. Yep. You're riding it. Just ride it all the way down. That's it. I think he's going to talk a little bit about the arm wrap propel here. Passed it. And well done. So he climbed up the back where Ben is, yes, and then he's come yep. over the, the, the top there, and now he's coming down the, the other side. Yeah, we basically sent him on a, a you know, out and back course so that they had to manage it going up and down because it can be very different. You can do it that way. If you do it the other way around, holding your arm into the rope, right, and that way you can walk down with it instead of walking it backwards. So he's he's talking about the arm wrap propel, which is, you know, on moderate to even somewhat steep terrain, is much more efficient and and easier to get through knots and everything else. You'll put like one safety, and then of course you'll have your second safety for when you move between anchors because you always want to be connected. Uh, but yeah, we'll uh, get down there, clip in, just kind of grab the rope, wrap it around, and and walk with it in your hand, which, you know. Means you have to really pay attention to where you put your feet. <laughs> so you don't don't want to be ran, you know hanging solely on your arm if you can help it by any means. But um, yeah, I mean, and there were sections where we would, you know, it might be like forty degrees and soft snow, and we'd just basically wrap an wrap an arm around it, put a carabiner on, and and basically run down through sections like that, just because it's much faster and speed is safety in the mountains. So being able to manage your systems quickly and move quickly from anchor to anchor and and know where the uh jeopardized spots are is is huge so that's where, why we had everybody out <coughs> about how many years into your climbing career did you start feeling really confident and comfortable uh using these systems oh wow <laughs> I think I felt incredibly confident right off. But I <laughs> of course. That, that was from a lack of knowledge. Because you knew you know? everything, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I read all these books and I knew all this stuff. and you know. But as far as like, uh, I mean, because this is just one aspect of what you're managing both in your mind and physically. I mean, you got to pay attention to drinking so you're staying hydrated so you don't get you know cerebral or pulmonary edema. You've got to manage what food you're eating and when and where and, you know moving things up the mountain and then also weather and, you know, the objective hazards in the terrain, whether it's avalanche or rockfall, uh, other climbers moving above you that can knock things down. I mean, there's just so much going on at any given moment that uh, the less you have to think about 
the systems. And I guess that's when I would say I, I felt better. It probably took me, you know, and this was a new thing for me too. I mean, until, uh, you know, using fixed lines on Denali, I guess, the first time in 97. And I'd done a number of uh, other technical climbs where, you know, you might throw an ascender in and, and do uh, some of that. And so it's like I, I understood the systems, but it's definitely, uh, it takes years of experience to uh, really feel comfortable with it. And to yeah. do it well, yeah. I think, right. efficiently right. as well. So like you're saying, you, you know, not have to think about it. You want it to be second nature. You want to just kind yes. of be re uh, like an instinct. You just do it. Yep. You don't have to think about it. Yeah. And that's, you know, you don't want to get complacent. And so knowing that you're, you know, focusing on everything at hand, but also that, you know, it just becomes second nature. That's the key. But Ed, by the time we got through the first couple of rotations was just, you know, kind of a master of the fixed line movement. So <laughs> it's kind of fun to watch people progress. That's great. Well, um, so next week, uh, we're actually going to uh, do some real climbing. You guys are going <laughs> to uh, make it up to Camp 1 and set up Camp 1. And uh, it's actually, it's a fun episode. It's uh, one, one more look into the glamorous side of uh, climbing these big mountains. <laughs> Is there one? I, I forget. <laughs> let, let's, let's see how many how many dudes we can pack in a three-man tent um especially <laughs> what happens next week so ah uh, yes the glamour and the effervescent smell as well <laughs> yes yes climbers smell smell glorious so yeah. <laughs> um yeah so next week's gonna be a lot of fun we actually really get going on the climbing um and uh get some more just incredible views so uh thanks as always brian this is just fantastic stuff yeah thanks for having me and we'll see all of you next week bye bye the rest of Everest has been watched millions and millions of times all over the world since 2006, and it's all been free, but it's not free for me. If you're a fan, then let me know. You can like the rest of Everest on Facebook, write a review on iTunes, subscribe on YouTube, or even help me pay the bills with a financial donation. It doesn't take much, and quite literally, your donations make this show possible. They honestly pay for everything. You can make a one-time donation or set up a monthly contribution through my website, Help me out, and I'll give you a download of our film, Everest, The Other Side, as well as some other goodies. Thanks, as always, to our announcer, Marlon May, from MarlonMay.com, and to Wendy Wu for providing the show's theme song. Find her on iTunes or at WendyWu.com. Thank you for watching the rest of Everest. For more information about the show and upcoming expeditions, be sure to visit TheRestOfEverest.com. <laughs>